Hi everyone, in this series of video I'll be discussing the concept of molecular polarity and how it relates to the structures that you learn how to predict in the VSEPR theory, using VSEPR theory. So first off, before we can get to molecular polarity, we have to kind of, uh, discuss this idea that covalent bonds are not always um, uh, the electrons in a covalent bond, I should say, are not always equally shared. And this is something that we can see in experiments. And here's just kind of one example of how a molecule will behave uh, in, you know, if you have an electric field uh, turned on versus turned off. Um, and so this molecule is HF, okay, where you have basically uh, a sharing of electrons obviously between the H and the F making that single bond. You can draw that Lewis structure at this point. And so the molecule looks like this, right? There's an a, uh, H and, a, and an F. And in if you have a, you know, a bunch of these molecules in a neutral, you know, electric field where it's not turned on, where there's no positive or negative end to this plate, then the electrons, I mean, the molecules would just kind of be swimming around randomly. There will be no directionality to this, these molecules at this point. But as soon as you turn this um, electric field on and one side of the plate becomes very negative and the other side of the plate becomes very positive, in other words there's a potential difference now, you start seeing that the molecules that uh, initially were just orienting themselves randomly start to have some directionality to them. And what I mean is that all the um, hydrogen end of the molecule would start pointing towards the negative plate and all the fluoride end of the molecule would start pointing towards the positive plate. That suggests that there is um, attraction between the hydrogen end of the molecule to the negative and there's attraction of the uh, fluoride end of the molecule towards the positive plate, which implies, of course, that because this is a negative plate, the hydrogen must be somehow positively charged in this molecule. And the, um, the because this side is positive, then the fluoride must be somehow negatively charged. So this was discovered a long time ago. And so people realized that really um, electrons, even in a covalent bond, they're not shared equally. Okay, so some, one of the atoms in that bond will take, uh, will basically attract the electrons more toward itself in comparison to the other atom. So the property that we use to quantify how much attraction the, uh, an atom can, you know, uh, uh, put on an electron, how much uh, that electron is attracted to that atom in a covalent bond is referred to as electronegativity. Okay, so again, the definition is it's the ability of an atom in a molecule that's involved in a covalent bond to attract shared electrons to itself. Now, electronegativity is not something that you can measure necessarily, but you can calculate um, electronegativity values uh, and give it a certain scale based on atomic properties like uh, uh, electron affinity, uh, ionization energy, those are things that we can actually measure. So a uh, person named Linus Pauling, who's actually a very well-known scientist, won two Nobel Prizes, he um, a long time ago in the, in the 30s basically came up with this scale of um, electronegativity. And as you can see here, the way this is kind of shown is uh, as a three-dimensional three um, you know, block, so the higher it is, the higher the electronegativity value. So you can see that the trend goes this way. Basically, it goes in diagonal this way, increasing electronegativity. So fluorine is the most electronegative element in the entire periodic table, uh, followed by oxygen and nitrogen. And um, these three are usually considered, you know, your number one, number two, number three, most electronegative elements. And then everything else kind of follows from there. The nonmetals in general, they tend to be more electronegative than the metals. You can see all the metals are here, and they tend to have very low electronegative uh, negativity values. Again, this is related to two of the properties we talked about in the quantum chapter in chapter seven, which is electron affinity and ionization energy. So um, if you look at um, electronegativity, therefore, it allows you to categorize bonds 
particularly covalent bonds, as something that we call either a polar bond or a nonpolar bond. Okay, uh, a polar bond is basically a bond where there's a clear, um, you know, unequal sharing between the two atoms that uh, make up that bond. So just like the case that I just mentioned in in HF and hydrogen fluoride, the hydrogen is less electronegative. So if you look at hydrogen, you know, hydrogen has a value of 2.1 in this scale and flor uh, flor fluorine has a value of 4.0. So there's a difference between the two, 4.0 minus 2.1, which is 1.9. And so that tells you that the bond uh, the fl the fluorine atom in this case will attract electrons to itself m a lot more so than the hydrogen, and the difference is 1.9 there. Okay, that's a pretty polar covalent bond. Now, this is a kind of a convenient scale to use to determine whether a bond is polar or nonpolar uh, in terms of covalent bonds, or whether it's an ionic bond. Okay, and the scale is very, I would say, very. Um, uh, you know, it's just rule of thumb. It's not exactly on the on the value, but generally you can look at bonds this way. Okay, if you take the electronegativity difference between two atoms that share a covalent bond, and the difference is less than 0.4 or equal to 0.4, then um, that bond will be considered a nonpolar bond. In other words, the electrons are pretty much shared equally. Okay. However, if the difference is bigger than 0.4 but less than 2.0, then we consider that uh, a polar covalent bond, as shown here. And if the difference is bigger than 2.0, then we would consider that at that point to be an ionic bond, okay? Because the electrons are so unequally shared that basically one of the electrons will just jump to the other uh, atom and, and leave the first atom, okay? So you can see how this three. Um, this is really, you know, what you can think of as a continuum. It's really a, a range, not so much a hard value. And that's why I want to kind of give you that uh, warning at the beginning. You don't want to just think about everything that's 0.4 is, you know, nonpolar. Sometimes they might be a little bit depending on, you know, the application, but um, most of them we can think of as being nonpolar. Okay, so what's an example of a nonpolar bond? Well, you just find something that has a difference of about 0.4 or less. So, for example, if you look at carbon-hydrogen bond, that's the one that you'll see very often. Carbon is 2.5, the electronegativity. Hydrogen is 2.1. The difference is exactly 0.4, so it's right at the borderline there between, uh, you know, polar and nonpolar. Usually, we would consider that to be a nonpolar bond, generally speaking. However, something like an NH bond, nitrogen and hydrogen, nitrogen is a electronegativity of 3, hydrogen is an electronegativity of 2.1, the difference is now 0 0.9. 0 0.9 means that you're now in this region, so that's considered a polar bond, okay? So that's something you want to keep in mind. Now, what is a nonpolar bond? Well, obviously, HH, you have two H's bonded to each other, that's a nonpolar bond because it's the same, so the difference is 0. You look at something like P and H, okay, P is a electronegativity value of 2.1, H is an electronegativity value of 2.1, so the difference is also zero. So a pH bond, like a pH 3, for example, that would be a um, uh, nonpolar bond as well.